everyone. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about building wellness because we can consciously design spaces to make us better physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. As an architect, I often collect images from spaces I've experienced that I found particularly powerful. Everything from the comforting presence of a columbarium to comfort the bereaved in Hong Kong, to the grandeur and formality of a colonnade that we found in a park in San Francisco, to the unexpected whimsy in a particularly bleak area of the Philadelphia airport. And I'd like to invite you now to think about spaces that have had an impact on you. Think about a place you sought out for a fun or happy experience. What were you looking to do in that space? Was it an interior space or was it outside? What was the lighting like, the temperature, the colors, the textures? What did you do in that space? And how did that space support your activities. Once you have that good, solid picture locked in your mind, I'd like you to think about another space, this time one that you looked at when you'd had a tough day, maybe got some bad news. How is that space a little bit different? What about it gave you solace, protection, comfort? Space feels like something, doesn't it? I've been noticing this my whole life, from when I was a little girl who would hide under or behind a piece of furniture or crawl on top of the refrigerator. I always noticed that the enclosure or lack thereof, the point of view I had, made a difference in the way a space looked and felt. And when I went to architecture school, I learned that design isn't just about aesthetics and form giving or about building performance. Even though those things are important, what really makes a difference is how people feel in our spaces. That's why I want to talk to you a little bit about research. And you might wonder, research, what does that have to do with architecture? Well, the very best spaces know how to tell a story. They know how to reach us emotionally. And what if we could do that every single time? What if we could use what we know about how people think and behave and act and consciously design for those moments in our spaces? Because the truth is, I can't design for you only being in my space when you're whole and healthy and fully functional. I have to think about what you're going to do when you might be in a time of stress. And stress is something that all of us are feeling more and more and more these days. What started out in our primitive bodies as a fight or flight, healthy response to being chased by a tiger, for example, has now turned into a very toxic physiological event. All that adrenaline and cortisol that we're not burning off running from a tiger is making it harder for us to sleep Harder, harder for us to think straight, harder for us to solve problems, and most of all, harder for us to be resilient in the face of change in our life. And believe it or not, I think architecture can make a difference. I'd like to introduce a concept called salutogenesis. Now, a lot of people look at me when I say that and say, is that a real word? It is a real word, and it literally means health generating. Think about that. Think about the power to actually create well-being in space. And I like to think about salutogenesis as having five components. The first of these is something called biophilia, which is a term coined by Edward O. Wilson to describe the fact that as human beings, we are literally part of nature. Therefore, our bodies are hardwired to respond to our natural environment. When we are out in nature, at a beach, in a garden, in a forest, our whole neurological system is calm and attuned to that environment. So why wouldn't we want to bring that experience into the built worlds that we create? Why wouldn't we want 
to create atriums and balconies and roof gardens in our designs? Why wouldn't we want to create large expanses of glass that blur the connection between inside and outside, that provide natural light and views? Why wouldn't we want to use natural materials, textures, forms, even patterns, and the random shapes and forms that we can find in nature? When we use these things in design, we help people to be their best selves in our spaces. Which brings me to a second component of salutogenesis called sense of coherence. A sociologist named Aaron Antonovsky discovered this phenomenon, and it's basically about the fact that we're always understanding our environment by making analogies to spaces and experiences we've had before. So for example, when you walked into this auditorium tonight, to the extent that it's like any other auditorium you've ever been in in your life, you knew that the best seating would probably be in the front towards the middle and that you probably wanted to avoid the seats in that back corner, sorry. So you knew also that all the activity was gonna happen on the stage, right? And that can happen in any space. But as architects, we wanna consciously use that idea of sense of coherence to think about spaces that people might have a hard time finding their way in or spaces that might be associated with unpleasant or stressful memories like a hospital. How would it be different if you walked into a hospital and instead of having the typical institutional cues you expect to find, you found a comforting environment that reminded you of a restaurant or a spa or even your home? How would you think differently, feel differently, physiologically react viscerally to that environment. It would be a lot different, right? And you would feel a lot more confident and empowered in that environment. Which brings me to the third principle of salutogenesis, which is something called self-efficacy, believing you can. When we believe we can, we're able to do things we never thought possible, right? And isn't that how we want everybody to feel in our spaces, in our world? Self-efficacy can be something as simple as being able to rearrange chairs and tables to suit the activity or the group you're with. It can mean customizing or personalizing your space to make it what you need and want it to be. But self-efficacy can also be about how intuitively you can find your way in a building when you don't need to ask for help because you can figure it out. Or that experience of hierarchy in space that we can choose to consciously create or not. I think we've all had that experience of walking up to a desk because we needed help and the desk was high and the person was behind a computer and we had to stand there hoping, trying to get their attention, right? Did you feel empowered in that moment? Did you feel like you mattered or what you needed was going to get taken care of? Not so much. How would it have been different if that person was sitting at a table with no barrier between you and them or standing up ready to greet you? And those kinds of moments, those kinds of pieces and parts in the environment, those little details, those are the cues that tell you you are welcome, you are an equal here, or someone is in charge and you're not. They're the things that we use to understand space and our place within it. The fourth element of salutogenesis that I wanna talk about is something called the relaxation response. Now sociologists have been studying this as a way to help people consciously choose to meditate and calm themselves down. As an architect, I'm not a yogi. I can't follow you into every building I design and cue you through the spaces. But what I can do are leave things called positive distractions in the space. And just like I do some of my best problem solving when I'm playing Candy Crush, when we have positive distractions, all the whirling thoughts in our stressed out minds 
get forced to the background because we're giving our minds just enough to think about, just that appropriate level of complexity that we can't have out of control thoughts. We're forced to calm down. We're forced to center ourselves. We're forced to refocus, and just by refocusing on something that interests us, we're naturally calming down. So what does that look like in space? Well, it can look like a really intriguing form. It can look like the play of light and shadows that changes as the day goes on. It can look like interesting patterns and textures, even choices of material that look different in different light or as you move around them. All of those things that fascinate you about your environment, all of those things that give you a focal point something to think about, something to focus on, something to occupy your mind. The fifth aspect of salutogenesis is something called prospect and refuge. So when we think back to that primitive brain and how we're naturally hardwired to think as human beings, we want to survey our environment from a safe place. Much as an early human, might have stood at a cave on a hilltop looking out, making sure that no predators were stalking them. Human beings naturally want to feel that they've got their back. Think about the last time you might have sat at a desk and someone walked behind you and startled you. Happens a lot in today's open office work plans, right? And it's stressful. It's stressful because we don't know what's coming at us. Think about how when you walk into a room, people naturally choose the spaces that are against a wall, where they can see the door, where they can see the activity happening around them, right? That's prospect and refuge. That sense of safety, security, that lets your brain relax and focus on what you really need to do, not whether somebody's going to come up behind you. So what does that look like in design? It means we have to think about the fact that there are both spaces that are very social and active and open, and spaces that need to be more quiet, more protected, more enclosed. We need to think a lot more about edges to rooms. And the edges aren't just walls. They can be enclosures. They can be alcoves. They can be <laughs> built-in benches and spaces that protect us that let us see what's going on and choose for ourselves to what degree we want to participate. They can be that open vista so when you walk in the front door of a building, you can see multiple destinations at once and understand where you want to go easily and quickly. They can be about rooms that don't have blind corners that let us see and understand what's going on around us. So now that you know a little bit more about salutogenesis and why it matters to build wellness, I want to talk to you about why you should care. Because you might be thinking, this is great, but I'm not an architect, right? Well, what I'm hoping is that this talk will help you to start to notice, to start to see all of the elements that make up a space, and to start to evaluate for yourself whether they're good or not, whether they're making you better or not. And I hope that as you do that, you'll also start to be an advocate for quality built environments because everybody deserves to be in a space where they can be their best self. I hope that you will at least understand that there are antidotes to bad environments and that if you do nothing more than spend 10 minutes outside in the sun before you walk into a windowless room, you will at least have reset your nervous system to make the negative effects of being in that space a little bit less bad. I also hope that you'll understand that there really is no substitute for spaces that are authentic. The spaces that have the warmth and vitality that make us naturally seek them out. The spaces that make us feel important, empowered, strong. And just like this image of my daughter, which is right here, 
at the local Contemporary Arts Center, standing in that atrium of bridges with natural light filtering down, being able to look above and below, see everything. I hope you will understand that we can build wellness, that we can create environments that empower all of us to be our best selves. Thank you very much.